Thank you very much, uh, Felix. Um, <clears throat> so my name is Christophe Goulet. I'm senior research fellow at the, uh, the Academy and uh, uh, advisor on uh, economic, social, and cultural rights. Um, welcome again to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to co-organize this first plenary panel with uh, the High Commissioner for Human, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, FIAN International, and the International Service for Human Rights. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic is having detrimental impact on the enjoyment of the rights of the most vulnerable in the whole world. Even in Geneva, in spring, we have seen thousands of people queuing almost half a day to receive some food assistance. In this panel discussion, we will take the example of the right to food with Ana Maria Suarez Franco from Fian International. We will also discuss the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on other economic social rights and on civil and political rights. Um, we will look at the responses of the UN mechanisms and also of the African and Inter-American human rights system. Um, Ambassador Lauber already said that the human rights system and global and, and regional systems responded by asking states to take human rights based uh, uh, approach in responding to the COVID crisis. We will see that the global and re regional human rights systems responded, responded quickly to the COVID-19 crisis, described by the United UN High Commissioner for Human Rights as a colossal test of leadership re requiring coordinated action. For example, in April, the Committee on ESC Rights underlined that states should give priority to the most vulnerable and ensure that no one will be left behind in taking the measures necessary to combat this pandemic. And that states should ensure that the extraordinary mobilization of resources to deal with the crisis provides the impetus for long-term resource mobilization towards the full and equal enjoyments of ESC rights to make sure that the world is better prepared for future pandemics and disasters. In July, the CEDAW committee calls states to be guided by the principles of non-discrimination, gender equality, and leave no one behind of the SDGs in their response to the crisis. It also calls states to emerge from the COVID-19 crisis with increased solidarity by adhering to human rights norms, promoting inclusive governance, social justice, and peace. These timely initiatives deserve further reflections. How can human rights mechanisms monitor post-pandemic recovery, recovery programs to ensure that they combat inequalities that were made evident during the crisis? How can they contribute to the building back better? Here are some of the questions that we will be discussing this, in this panel. From a procedural perspective, we have also, also had some information from uh, Ambassador Lauber and uh, from the director of the AU Front of the Rights Agency about the fact that lots of these treaty bodies and special procedures, it's difficult to, for them to continue to work. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has forced many activities of human rights makers to transit to online setting and to review their working methods. For example, special rapporteurs cannot do country visits anymore. And it is difficult for treaty bodies to examine state parties' reports. So here are the, some other questions that we will be discussing. What were the challenges in work modalities put in place and what lessons can be learned, for example, from online sessions? What was the role played by the regional systems? And which are the impacts of the crisis on civil society participation? And which aspects have to be taken into account to mitigate restrictions to such participation? So to discuss these, uh, these questions and the responses of the human rights system to, to, to the COVID crisis, I have a, a fantastic panel of, I have four, we have four panelists who will each of them talk 10 to 12 minutes. Uh, Nada al Nashif, the Deputy High Commissioner for Human Rights. Mikiko Otani, member of the Committee on the Rights of the Child and member of the Inter-Committee Working Group on COVID-19. Sandra Liebenberg, Oppenheimer, Chair in Human Rights Law and a distinguished professor at the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa and member of the Committee on ESC Rights. And in Geneva with us, uh, Ana Maria Suarez Franco, permanent representative of FIAN in Geneva. And we will start with the Madam, High Commission, Madam Deputy High Commissioner, you have the floor. 
Thank you very much, Christoph, for giving me the floor. Good morning, everyone. And I'm sorry I'm not with you, but I, I think we're still trying to find this balance between being there physically and, and being with you, uh, certainly in spirit. And thanks very much for the timely invitation to reflect on the role of the mechanisms, our mechanisms in COVID-19 responses, more generally, um, how human rights systems can help and, and lead uh, indeed to show the way towards more equal, more just, more resilient and greener societies, we hope. Um, at the SDG moment in September, the United Nations Secretary General issued a call for us all to raise our ambition. Uh, ambition to carry out a transformative and inclusive recovery. We're focusing a lot on building back better. Uh, to deliver on the 2030 agenda and to use the SDGs still, despite the slippage, as a springboard uh, from which to leap to the world that we desire. And this ambition must be driven by our member states' obligation to promote, to protect and fulfill all human rights, including the economic, social and cultural rights, um, which we find to be so present with us today. And human rights systems, especially the mechanisms, can serve as the standard bearers and set this level of ambition, including guiding its course. In addition to being a test of societies, of governments, of communities and individuals, COVID-19 is a test of global and regional human rights systems. And I would say that these systems have risen to the challenge under very, very extraordinary circumstances. And I'd like to highlight both the work and the potential of the system, the human rights system, including, as you've just um, highlighted, Christoph, treaty bodies, the special procedures, and the Universal Periodic Review, our UPR mechanism, in addressing the current public health emergency, of course, which has very quickly become a human rights crisis. Since the beginning of the pandemic, the office efforts have aimed at anchoring a human rights perspective at the heart of the response by member states, our UN partners, civil society, and the private sector, uh, as well as ensuring that the human rights impacts of COVID-19 are effectively addressed during the recovery. The office has provided very relevant guidance and technical assistance as the pandemic has spread across the globe to our member states, to national human rights institutions, our civil society partners. But we've also engaged at, uh, with the UN at headquarters, respective headquarters levels, but also regional and country levels in developing COVID-19 human rights indicators and practical targets that really have been a centerpiece uh, at the country level in particular in the design of the responses, of these national responses and our advocacy as UN system with states on very topical human rights issues that have come out um, during the uh, pandemic. Uh, and of course, the international human rights mechanisms have stepped up to the human rights challenges which the, the, the pandemic has uh, presented. Uh, with the whole spectrum of rights, all UN treaty bodies issued wide-ranging recommendations guiding this rights-based response to COVID-19. For example, on access to vital healthcare services and goods, including eventually vaccines, on which we have spoken out with the WHO and other partners, without discrimination. On states of emergency, on enforced disappearances. We've offered guidance on a range of measures uh, to mitigate impact on vulnerable groups. Again, speaking about precarious workers, persons working in the informal economy, women, children, migrants, persons deprived of liberty, persons with disabilities, and indigenous people. Special procedures mandate holders have also taken many initiatives relating to COVID-19, issuing guidelines, for example, on the prohibition of evictions, developing key principles on ensuring the functioning of justice systems, outlining key areas of concern with regard to racial equity and equality. And they have developed an online COVID-19 civic freedom tracker to monitor the use, the possible abuse of emergency powers, which has been a, a very early theme that we raised attention to. The Human Rights Council has remained very much involved in this uh, information sharing and the impact of the human rights uh, on human rights by COVID-19. Last month, we organized uh, an enhanced interactive dialogue on the pandemic 
drawing on the expertise of the WHO and the International Labour Organization to weigh in on the importance of this rights dilemma. We, we focus a lot on lives and livelihoods, obviously, um, with the perspective of the ILO. And member states continue to underline the centrality of human rights during the adoption of the UPR reports in this last session of the Council. The regional mechanisms, much like the global ones, have tended to focus on the protection of core rights during the pandemic, as well as the importance of proportionality in the restrictions, the importance of the respect of the rights of vulnerable groups, including through gender responsiveness. And this clearly shows that we are talking about complementary systems, regional and global, uh, and the need to strengthen our cooperation and coordination at each time, of course, with a very strong emphasis on practical action and actionable agendas at the national level. Um, and some examples include what we did as an office, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, with the African Union in awareness raising on women's rights and COVID-19. We also issued a joint statement with the African Commission for Human and People's uh, um, Rights, calling for global solidarity involving economic relief measures uh, through debt relief or the restructuring of debts. Uh, but of course, this is just one end of the spectrum. Uh, the human rights mechanisms, guidance, recommendations, and analysis have underscored the insistence um, on putting people and their individual rights as well at the heart of the response. Um, and these must be and are only valuable if we can translate them into real impact in order that they can really bring the relief that we seek for uh, those many thousands, hundreds of thousands facing extreme poverty now. Um, with the pandemic outbreak, the office stepped up advice on economic stimulus packages, on long-term economic recovery, uh, with a focus on curbing inequalities, countering the drivers of exclusion and leaving no one behind. A, a stark reminder of, of how much we have uh, really lost in terms of the opportunities over the last few months even. And I'd just like to give some examples of that. Um, there were many national response plans um, that explicitly mention and unpack human rights mechanisms recommendations. For instance, in Jordan, my own country, um, the UN COVID-19 plan identifies and outlines uh, these interventions. For example, the specific vulnerabilities of people in detention facilities regarding victims of sexual abuse. Uh, journalists and children born to Jordanian mothers and non-Jordanian fathers as, as just examples of who can be further excluded uh, as a result of the pandemic. In Serbia, uh, the analyses of the impact of COVID-19 on vulnerable groups meant that we produced some thinking uh, on workers in the informal sector, the homeless, Roma communities, LGBTI persons, and this was really very heavily referenced and building on the work of the human rights mechanisms in order to enable what we believe could be a more effective, a more inclusive response by the United Nations with the government, with civil society and others. In Cambodia, our office is advising on human rights based policy options for transformative economic growth, uh, including, for example, one particular issue, employment for women in the informal sector. This is also a time to strengthen advocacy on the value of systematically connecting the 2030 agenda and human rights reporting and implementation, building on some good practices. In some countries, for example, Costa Rica, Mauritius, and Samoa, these countries have linked the voluntary national reporting and SDG implementation with the reporting processes to the human rights mechanisms, ensuring that the voluntary national reporting reflects human rights issues and can influence and advance um, both human rights and sustainable development. At this stage, we really want to argue for the convergence of the targets uh, in, in these areas. And um, as we work on translating human rights norms and standards into impact, of course, accountability is key. I think we've heard a little bit about this already. And the human rights mechanisms can and should hold states to account through a continuous review of the implementation of states' obligations, including the 2030 Agenda obligations and the Paris Agreement, uh, through orienting these global and regional standard-setting uh, approaches and building consensus 
on what constitutes better recovery, including the engagement with the high-level political forum on sustainable development. Um, and ensuring that rights holders have a say in these processes, making a special effort to give voice to vulnerable groups. Uh, and finally, um, and I'd like to refer back here to what Michael O'Flaherty uh, put an emphasis on at the end, I confirm that we do need to preserve the space for civil society participation in the work of the human rights mechanisms. Um, while, as you heard already, all the mechanisms have shifted to digital or hybrid sessions, they have found innovative, very creative solutions to maintaining civil society participation. Obviously, we are being stretched a lot, and I'm sure you'll hear from my fellow panelists um, but we do need to make sure that civil society participation remains inclusive, meaningful, and free from intimidation or reprisals offline and online alike. I'll stop there with many thanks again for giving me the chance. Thank you so much for this uh, fantastic uh, uh, presentation with uh, lots of substance and also some questions about procedures no? and NGO participation in the work of the UN human rights uh, system, something we will come back to. Uh, now I give the floor to Nikiko uh, Otani, uh, member of the Committee on Rights of the Child and of the Inter-Committee Working Group on COVID-19. Thank you, Christoph. Um, a few minutes, city bodies have reacted uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic in two common ways. Adopting statements and guidance is the one, uh, which was already deferred by uh, you, and integrating questions on COVID, uh, uh, integrating questions on COVID-19 in the list of issues and list of issues prior to reports is the other. These immediate reactions of the treaty bodies is the manifestation of the commitment of the treaty bodies to ensure the protection of human rights during the pandemic. Now our task is monitoring the real impact of COVID-19 and the measures taken in each country according to the guidance the treaty bodies issued. How can treaty bodies carry out country-specific monitoring in the current situation where all the human rights treaty bodies have postponed reviewing stage since April, which is also uh, mentioned by previous speakers? Good news is this month, the Committee on Enforced Disappearance conducted dialogue with Iraq on additional information. While more than 500 NGOs in their joint statement called for treaty bodies to resume state reviews. I believe that treaty bodies should start state reviews from the beginning of 2020 in whatever possible mo modalities, in person, or in hybrid or online. It is imperative for the treaty bodies to have dialogue with states and make recommendations in the country-specific context at the critical time during, the post, during and post-COVID-19. Further monitoring gap is unacceptable. Although the human rights concerns due to the COVID-19 COVID are similar everywhere, the seriousness of the impact and particular measures required may be different, reflecting, for example, the pre existing inequalities and fragile service systems. A question is how soon the treaty bodies can monitor all the countries. It is very concerning as the backlog of state review has increased since April this year. I think we should consider the monitoring work of the treaty bodies as a system. This approach has been emphasized in the discussion of 2020 treaty bodies. Last time he mentioned. It is also underlying the proposal for the predictable coordinated review calendar by all treaty bodies. Such calendar enables us to avoid too many reviews of the same country in short period. On the other hand, prevent from creating too long monitoring gaps for any country. This proposal received strong support and was taken up in the co-facilitators report. Now its implementation is needed more than ever so that treaty bodies can avoid monitoring gaps for all states 
as much as possible in this critical time of crisis and recovery from the pandemic. It is so important for the treaty bodies to address the country-specific situations, collect and share good practices, and mobilize the necessary international cooperation through space review. When the treaty bodies review countries from 2021 onward, its impact on the human rights protection in that country should be maximized using the compilation of statements by human rights treaty bodies in the context of COVID-19 issued by the OHSR last month. For example, uh, the right to food is addressed in the statement of Committee on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights, CIDO Committee, CIC, and CIPD. Third, uh, Committee on uh, Elimination of Dis Racial Discrimination, not specifically the right to food, but mentioned the impact of the pandemic that has further deepened structural inequalities affecting vulnerable groups and minorities with regard to economic security. The treaty bodies can integrate the perspectives of other treaty bodies on the common issues such as this, the right to food in state review by consulting the compilation. The working group on COVID-19 established as an intercommittee body should discuss how the treaty body system can strengthen the coordinated approach to ensure protection of human rights during and post COVID-19 pandemic through space review and other activities such as joint webinars on common thematic issues using the compilation of COVID-19 statements. Now I'd like to turn to the issue of the impact of pandemic on the work modalities of treaty bodies. One obvious impact is the use of online work modalities as you have already seen in many treaty bodies. The challenges and difficulties experienced in the online work have been already addressed on many occasions, which include accessibility and security of platform, connectivity, financial support for the online work and time difference. The online sessions have been conducted by necessity rather than by choice. It spotlighted the reality of the UN Human Rights Treaty Body as a global body which I found interesting because this case as a global body is not so prominent uh, in our in-person in uh, sessions because wherever uh, we are based generally, we already be in the conference room in Geneva when we meet with the state and civil society and other stakeholders. But uh, actually the treaty bodies come from various parts of the world including the places where electricity supply and online connection is a big challenge. Members are working in the different time zones. I believe that most of the issues can and should be solved one way or another as soon as possible, but there will, be, there will not be the immediate solution for this time zone issue. As far as the meeting is scheduled within the Geneva working hours, it is always not a convenient time for some members from particular regions. So today I'd like to discuss this time zone issue in relation to the regional dimension of the treaty bodies work, which is supported in the co-facilitators report for the reasons of increased domestic stakeholders accessibility, enhanced visibility of the treaty body system and closer interaction with national and regional human rights system. As the co-facilitators suggested, treaty bodies' engagement with the states at the regional level may take various forms, such as organizing reviews of states in the UN regional offices, follow-up webinars on concluding observations, and sharing good practices on follow-up recommendations. If the treaty bodies are serious to increase the engagement with states and stakeholders at the regional level in whatever modality, it requires the capacity development of the OHCHR regional offices to support the treaty bodies' work. The OHCHR over the years has expanded its field presence, including its regional offices. In my view, 
it makes much sense for the OHHR regional offices to have the component of supporting treaty bodies work at the regional level. Such component can also be regional focal point to support capacity building programs to the state in the region for writing reports and implementing the recommendations. If such component is integrated in the work of the OHHR regional offices, their staff can provide the support for treaty bodies work so that treaty bodies can have online meetings outside the Geneva working hours. Finally, the impact on the participation of civil society. Views of civil societies are most important in this regard. But if I may share my observations, the level of participation of civil society is definitely enhanced in the online sessions. I'm aware that accessibility to online platform and connectivity are equally a challenge for civil society. However, talking from my own experience as a national NGO in engaging with the UN human rights treaty bodies for many years, cost and time for travel, taking work leave is far beyond the obstacles, including the cost for participating in online meetings. I believe that treaty bodies can enormously benefit from wider participation of civil society in online meetings provided that two conditions are met, predictability and security. Communication with the civil society is critical. The announcement of the work schedule of the treaty bodies needs to be made enough in advance and effectively disseminated to reach out all interested stakeholders so that civil society can make necessary preparation, including technical arrangements, addressing security concerns, and coordination among themselves. Finally, if the treaty bodies increase the engagement with civil society through online, the treaty bodies together with the OHHR also need to be enhanced the alertness and the capacity to address the security concerns and protect civil society participating in the online session from the reprisals. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Miki, for, for this uh, very complete uh, presentation about the work of the, the joint work of the treaty bodies and, uh, and uh, also on the response on the substance and on the procedural aspects. So thank you for your own experience sharing about the, the role of NGOs and participation of NGOs in treaty body work. Um, now I give the floor to uh, Sandra Liebenberg, uh, who is member of the Committee on ESC Rights. Sandra, you have the floor. So, uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Christopher, Deputy High Commissioner, and sister panelists. Um, so, the pandemic has really exposed how vulnerable we are as, as a species to pandemics and global shocks such as climate change, environmental destruction. And yet, um, in my view, human rights have not been a prominent feature of the government responses to the pandemic. The tendency has been to rely on public health and economic modeling data. And also the implicit assumption has been that governments should be given wide and overarching powers to deal with an emergency such as the pandemic. So in a conference that is looking at global and regional responses to the pandemic on this particular panel, I want to focus on what I believe are five contributions that human rights can make to COVID response and recovery strategies and to highlight how our own, my own committee that I currently sit on, the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, as well as the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, have highlighted these five essential dimensions. They are respectively an integrated response, priority setting, 
thirdly, accountability, 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 and lastly, international assistance and cooperation. So turning first to an integrated response, I think the important feature of human rights norms is that they have really shown us the importance of the interdependence and interconnectedness of human rights. Documents such as particularly the African Charter on Human and People's Rights is laudable for integrating in one instrument civil and political rights, economic, social, cultural, environmental rights, the right to development, the right to peace, the right to a healthy environment. And I think this pandemic has particularly highlighted the critical importance, as the Deputy High Commissioner noted, of economic, social and cultural rights. So countries who have not invested in their healthcare systems, in strong food distribution um, systems, as well as social protection schemes, have struggled to cope with the pandemic and will take longer to recover. So when the um, COVID pandemic broke out, CESC, the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, issued a statement in April, 9, uh, April 2020 highlighting the critical important, importance of investment in public health systems and social protection schemes. The African Commission similarly in June 2020 adopted a, a dedicated statement on the importance of economic, social and cultural rights in COVID response and recovery strategies. This is absolutely critical because Globally, many healthcare systems and social protection schemes have been devastated by austerity programs imposed in the wake of the 2008-2010 financial crisis. And particularly in Africa with the long history of colonialism, apartheid, structural adjustment programs, and unfavorable trade policies, um, many social programs have been significantly weakened. The African, the AU in 2001 adopted the Abuja Declaration in terms of which African countries committed to spend 15% of their budgets, their national annual budgets on health care. But latest reviews show that very, very few countries have met this target and some have even gone backwards in this regard. So indeed, the critical response of more investments in economic, social and cultural rights as the African Union and the Commission have also called for in the stimulus packages and measures also to combat tax evasion, illicit financial flows and other loss of resources, including through corruption, is going to be critical to emerging from this pandemic. However, the pandemic has also exposed the critical importance of civil and political rights. As has been noted, many governments have responded to the pandemic through limiting a number of rights through emergency type legislation. And this has often been accompanied by heavy handed security force action that has impacted on the most vulnerable in our society, largely people living in informal settlements and who are affected by poverty and social marginalization. This led the UN High Commissioner on Human Rights to issue a statement criticizing what she described as the toxic lockdown culture in a number of countries. 
now both the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and the African Commission on Human and People Rights in their statements on the pandemic have emphasized the critical importance of complying with the doctrines of legality, proportionality, necessity, temporality and mitigating measures to protect the most vulnerable in responding to the pandemic. A particular opportunity and point that the African Commission has highlighted in its responses has been the importance of timely and accessible access to information for populations affected by the pandemic and for civil society participation in measures taken to respond to the pandemic. So civil and political rights and respecting these rights to the maximum extent possible, sharing information, complying with the doctrine of proportionality helps to build the trust between government and the citizenry. And research has also shown how critical this trust is in um, building the legitimacy of the measures and ensuring citizen compliance and buy-in. Thirdly, human rights help us with priority setting. So human rights norms are particularly focused on the most vulnerable and marginalized and those suffering from systemic patterns of discrimination and marginalization. And this pandemic more than any other has illuminated and aggravated pre-existing patterns of inequality and disadvantage. These include impoverished communities living in overcrowded informal settlements. It includes those without access to water and sanitation services, those workers in the informal sector, migrant workers, refugees, asylum seekers, prisoners, um, indigenous people, those with disabilities, and in particular women who have experienced the brunt of um, gender-based violence during lockdown measures, as well as having to bear due to traditional gender roles, the disproportionate burden of home-based work, as well as having to care for families and elder relatives and children. And this again has been highlighted in the statements of both CESC as well as the African Commission and highlighting that the key focus of response and recovery strategies should be on groups most marginalized and subject to systemic discrimination. Then the theme of accountability, which has been touched on. Human rights help us with ensuring accountability, particularly in situations of crisis and emergency, when human rights are most vulnerable. They do this through ensuring effective remedies for human rights violations, and both the Commission, African Commission, and CESC has highlighted the critical importance of human rights remedies at national level, at regional level, and importantly, at international level. And as my colleague, Ms. Otani, has pointed out, the danger of an accountability gap at international level where treaty bodies cannot meet in person and periodic straight state reviews could fall behind um, in this context and the importance that there are ways of moving forward to ensure that the treaty body periodic review process does not fall further behind. The last point I want to highlight in this presentation where I believe that human rights make a vital contribution is on international assistance and cooperation. 
So as the Secretary General pointed out in his earlier report, uh, we live in a globalized world where the fates and fortunes of all are intertwined. If one country fails to control the spread of the virus, all countries are at risk. And we are only as strong as the weakest healthcare system. Now, two central pillars to enable countries to emerge from this pandemic is going to be universal access to an effective vaccine, firstly, and secondly, an effective and equitable, inclusive economic recovery program. And both the African Commission and CESC has addressed these two aspects. So in the context of vaccine development and access, a very good example of international cooperation and collaboration is the COVID-19 Global Access Initiative that seeks to pool resources in order to ensure equitable access to a diverse portfolio of potential vaccines. However, as the head of the African CDC has pointed out, it's going to be critical that substantial new financing is found to ensure African countries can access the vaccine and ensure that the critical threshold of 60% of the population is vaccinated. And this whole of Africa coordinated approach along with international partners such as the WHO, Gavi and CEPI are going to be critical. In addition, there's going to have to be international collaboration to ensure that there's an activation of all available flexibilities in intellectual property regimes, such as the Doha Declaration on the TRIPS Agreements, to ensure universal access to affordable, safe diagnostics, treatments and vaccines. These aspects have been highlighted by CESC, both in its latest general comment 25 on science and economic, social and cultural rights, as well as in its statement adopted on the pandemic. And then with regard to economic recovery, the Deputy High Commissioner mentioned the joint statement of the Chairperson of the African Commission, Mr. Solomon Durso and the High Commissioner on the need for international solidarity to assist African countries' economies that have been devastated by the pandemic and who are facing many rising challenges of food security, health collapse, social protection challenges. Um, what is going to be particularly critical is the issue of debt relief and even debt forgiveness going forward, um, particularly as many countries are facing the risk of debt defaults and sovereign debt crisis going forward. So this is going to be a real challenge, both for inter-regional collaboration and for international collaboration as a, as a whole. So in conclusion, human rights require states to comply to the pandemic in ways which reduce poverty and inequalities, which promote democracy, accountability, and international solidarity. And through allowing human rights norms to be our lodestars in responding to the pandemic, we can build fairer and more resilient societies, which will enable us to better withstand future pandemics, as well as the looming climate crisis facing the world. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sandy, Sandy, for this also very comprehensive uh, uh, presentation um, about your own work, the work of the committee, and the work of the African uh, system. Um, 
Now we move to the last uh, panelist, uh, Ana Maria Suarez Franco from Fian International, who will give a civil society perspective on the on the topic and with the example of the right to food. As you know, this afternoon we will have a working group on the right to housing and the right to health. And so now we focus uh, during this panel, uh, and and now with the presentation of Ana Maria on the on the right to food, and she will also uh, discuss a bit the the responses of the inter-American uh, system. So Ana Maria. You have Thank you very much, Christophe, and also to the Graduate Institute and the Geneva Academy, as well as the other panelists. Um, I like very much the keynote because uh, it shows how the different systems or silos, as he said, can be connected. And I, see, I think civil society organizations also play a role in connecting, uh, not just uh, through providing information, but we also work a lot to ensure that the different works uh, are consistent and also that regional and national systems use the international standards. So uh, I think this panel is uh, very important or this event in, in general. Um, and now I would like to emphasize on three aspects. The first is on the impact of COVID on the right to food. I think it's very important to go into this content because the people who are suffering this impact are those for whom the system exists. So all the measures that have been explained have to be thought in the sense of these people and communities. Uh, I will speak a bit on the impact of participation for civil society and, uh, as Christophe said, finalize with some of the responses of the inter-American human rights system. Um, Beginning with the impact on the right to food, um, which is the next slide, uh, the first impacts that we observed and were, were reported to us by people in the communities were uh, the closure of, of the schools and how that was really um, impeding the access to adequate food for many children that normally just have these school meals as their food in the whole day uh, and similarly the closure of social assistance centers um, and the closure of patients markets also uh, immediately food storage and speculation of prices were reported from very different uh, regions including in Europe first then in, in Asia and in the Americas also in Africa um, and the closure of informal markets, which especially in development countries is key for the survival of many people who are not connected to the formal labor work. Um, also affected were older people uh, because they were forbidden to go out and didn't have the possibility to access to food that might be available. And also uh, the digital payments and the fact that in many cases, the provision of food became digital was very excluding for those lacking of technologies. And this is not just for the people in Africa or Latin America who do not have access to internet, but it's also for people in uh, developed countries that do not know the technologies, do not know uh, how to use, for example, uh, the enterprises that have the apps, do not know the apps. So it's it was very excluding for the people. Uh, very relevant were the reports we got on the impact of, um, of the COVID on small food producers. Many were focused on what happens in, in the big cities, but also peasants, fishers, uh, and indigenous people, and especially also migrant workers were affected. And this is very concerning because this will go uh, to a long, longer term. Since this person were not able to sell their production, many uh, were destroying the food that they were producing in the, in the last uh, period. They, uh, they were having problems in harvesting due to the lack of, um, of uh, work because the, the migrating workers were not able to attend the yields. Problems in commercializing, especially because while the big supermarkets remained open, many of the farmer markets were closed and this had a huge impact on small food producers. Um, and also uh, some problems uh, on, on the reception of inputs like seeds. Some of them have traditional seeds, but the fact that in the past, 
uh, the more industrialized seeds have been imposed to peasants, many of them are, are already dependent on, on the industrial system and they have problems in ensuring the next cultivation. Uh, the impact of corporate uh, power was also very evident in, in many countries of those, uh, the global network on the right to food and nutrition work, the communities um, or permitting import of food that is normally produced in the country. And it's very problematic because while the companies had the way to influence the parliaments that were working uh, for civil society, it was impossible to mobilize, to contain these moves. And also we saw that in, in some countries, uh, the, the response measure, like for example, distributing food baskets were given to the big corporations and not to the small food producers. So, uh, for example, in one country, uh, the, co the state was collecting money from the private sector and paying money to the big supermarkets to distribute uh, food, which normally is ultra processed uh, products that are not, uh, not good for health, while uh, peasants were losing their provisions or were just requested uh, or were just yeah, facilitated through intermediating that they can get some people buying, but the money was not put into their work. And finally, on this uh, short diagnosis, uh, while the big institutions, the human rights institutions, the WFP, uh, the CFS and others were speaking about the global looming food crisis, what we found is that already many multiple local food crises are happening now. Uh, and a global blooming food crisis would come. Uh, I, I want to go quickly to that, and it's important to say that one of the biggest problems that we have in society now is that we, we are very fragile to pandemics due to other problems that already existed. I think uh, Professor Liebenberg already mentioned some of them. Um, but of course, the connection between land grabbing and the zoonotic processes has been expressed in many scientific publications, also in the new Right to Food and Nutrition Watch. The second article is dedicated to this. Um, the extensive use of pesticides also affected, for example, uh, workers, agricultural workers, who were very afraid that they would be more vulnerable to, to the impact of, of COVID on their health. The policies prioritizing agro-industrial fruit uh, and, and uh, favoring the global food chains uh, uh, is a problem because these food chains were more, more vulnerable to the lockdown measures. And therefore, uh, we think that it's very important to support also local uh, markets. Uh, the standardized diets of ultra-processed edible products increase the health vulnerability of people and also the digitalization of food um, is excluding the poor and all those conditions make our societies more fragile. I have here others but I think I don't have to go through them because uh, Professor Liebenberg referred to them but maybe it's also important to say that people are not just complaining, they are also looking for solutions and that these are solutions that should be inspiring for the human rights system institutions. Uh, we saw incredible solidarity at the local level and I think it's important to mention that the first report of the new special rapporteur on the right to food, Mr. Mar Michael Fackley, um, who calls for a transformation of the economic system, dedicates an important part to the solidarity, uh, also to respond to the crisis. In many countries, we saw litigation, like in Uganda, and, and people trying to influence in policy making at their local level. And the general claim that is now present, especially in, in, the, in the institutions in Rome, which deal uh, principally or mainly with the right to food, is for the transformation of food systems. So this is a big thing. I will not go deeper into that, but um, this is the general call. We need to change the food systems if we want to be resilient to the coming pandemics and avoid uh, 
more pandemics. Then, all this is important, but transmitting that to the system was very difficult due to the digitalization to which we were obliged. Um, many people said, yeah, we have bigger numbers of people participating and looking into the events, but unfortunately, uh, we, um, we consider that a bit a TV, a TV multilateralism. That means we see more, but we cannot do much, and especially we have lost all the spaces, the informal spaces that allow us to exercise influence on the system. So um, people were very, very afraid, and this is not just on the human rights system, but also on connected agencies of the UN, like the WHO, the, uh, the work in the Romi institutions, etc. Uh, and of course, this is, this is uh, deeper because many of the people for whom the system exists do not have stable access to internet connection or the needed technologies. Uh, the difficulties in time zones and languages were putting a lot of uh, pressure um, on the begin, so excluding many people. Uh, people were feeling that there is lack of transparency, so many in many times they didn't know how the meetings will happen, which would be the rules for participation, who ideas five organizations to speak and others who have different views do not speak. Uh, and and uh, we were doubting is, if what the rural movement says, not about us, without us, would still be possible. Um, so uh, as response to that, we were collecting the views of organizations and not just our network, but also other organizations were uh, sending letters to the Office of the High Commissioner and the Human Rights Council. Many things improved and we see the goodwill of the institutions, but we also see that there are shortcomings that are not able to be solved through the technologies. And therefore, uh, the general call in civil society is that hybrid is necessary now, but it cannot become the normal, the new normal. We can use that for some improvement, of course. For example, aut autistic movements were saying, oh, for us it's perfect because we are afraid to be in, in big groups. So it's better for us to send our video. But this is for specific groups, but we think uh, this should not become the only way and contact person uh, and informal contacts uh, remain being very important. And we uh, hope that when the crisis is uh, back, uh, we can, people can come back to Geneva and come back to interact with the, uh, with the institutions. Finally, uh, I wanted to highlight some of the relevant, um, relevant responses of the Inter-American Human Rights Commission. These are, in fact, very in line with the presentation uh, done by the High Commissioner and also by Sandra Liebenberg on the African system. Uh, the Inter-American Human Rights System also called for the application of the principles of reasonability, proportionality, and transparency uh, in the adoption of lockdown measures and contention, uh, and, and uh, that, uh, how the retrogressive measures should just be those needed uh, and really where uh, is not possible to have other alternatives. Uh, they also suggested measures relevant to maintain the access to food like, uh, and in general to an adequate standard of living like cred credit relief, restructuring debt uh, and tax payments, compensatory measures for people, people living in poverty. There was a general call for states to demand enterprises, companies, uh, to comply with uh, human rights and labor uh, standards, especially, of course, the obligation to respect human rights uh, of workers, consumers, and local communities. There were calls on how necessary would be a differentiated response to specific groups, and, and it's very related to what Professor Liebenberg said on the bigger, major impact on, on people in poverty and who have being victims of structural discrimination uh, along the history. There was a very specific uh, um, call to impede the lockdown impact on children access to school meals. And finally, also uh, the Inter-American Commission recalled for international cooperation, uh, same as the African one. So this 
is mainly what we have monitored and uh, I am happy to respond to questions on it. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll hand over directly to Sarah to introduce this panel and your panelists. Sarah, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Felix. Um, welcome, everyone. I wanted to thank Felix Kishmeyer and the Geneva Academy Human Rights Platform for focusing this conference on connectivity between the UN and regional human rights systems. It's a theme that I have written on um, and that was substantially inspired by the regional meetings hosted by the Geneva Academy's academic platform supporting the Treaty Body 2020 review. Uh, so it's nice to bring this theme home to Geneva. As Michael Flaherty reminded us this morning in his keynote, uh, the regional and UN systems were created as independent and freestanding systems, all of them, as were the treaty bodies themselves. Uh, but we also have made significant steps towards strengthening communication and cross-fertilization among them. For example, Olivier de Fruville and I were both on the Human Rights Committee when it held its first meeting with the International Court of Human Rights in San Jose, Costa Rica. And the committee is scheduled to have a second meeting uh, with the Inter-American System this session, although online. But communication among these systems remains cumbersome and sporadic. And the differing jurisprudence and procedures of these systems remain a complex labyrinth, as uh, we heard this morning, for all stakeholders, including states, the media, civil society, practitioners, and human rights victims. So to address both these challenges and ways to improve them, we have an excellent and diverse panel today. Um, I will introduce them briefly in order of speaker. Uh, we have Alexandra Skander Galan, postdoctoral researcher at the Center for Fundamental Rights at the Hertie School in Berlin. Uh, professor Olivier de Fruville, um, professor of law and director of the Paris Human Rights Center at Paris 2, former member of the Human Rights Committee and now member of the Committee on Enforced Disappearances. Ambassador Joel Hernandez Garcia, president of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, who I should note has had a stellar diplomatic and legal career in the UN system as well, and who I had the uh, personal privilege of knowing in a former life uh, when I was at the State Department and he was legal advisor for the Foreign Ministry of Mexico. So hi. Um, Lea Hochter, Regional Director of, for Europe from the Center for Reproductive Rights, who has done extensive and important advocacy work before the treaty bodies and the regional mechanisms. And then Gay So, D Executive Director for the Institute for Human Rights and Development in Africa, which conducts strategic litigation at the regional and national levels on the human rights situation in Africa. So we are going to start with Alexander, who will give a general presentation on substantive interactions between these systems. Then we will turn to Joel and Olivier to address uh, connectivity on procedural issues. And then Leah and Gay will offer their perspectives on, as strategic litigators um, on the relationship among these systems um, and how they see um, ways that the uh, systems can be played off each other as well as how connectivity among the systems can be improved. And I've asked each speaker to speak for about 10 minutes so that we will have uh, time for questions. And now I will turn it over to Alexander. Hi, Sarah, thank you very much. Can you see my slides? Yes, okay, perfect, thank you. Uh, so thank you to the Geneva Academy and to the Human Rights Platform. It, it's a real privilege and, and I would say an honor. Um, so um, I'm gonna speak about the common trends of the case law of the human rights uh, of, uh, of the UN treaty bodies. 
And I'll try to, to uh, briefly touch on, on risk and periods of these uh, common trends. So it has been feared since a long time that the proliferation of UN treaty bodies with competence to address individual complaints may create a risk of fragmentation of human rights law. Uh, Alexander, I'm sorry, but we're seeing the screen, but not the slides, I think. Oh, okay. And now? Yes, there we okay. go. <laughs> All right, perfect. Thank sorry. you. Um, so let, let us simply say that more ratifications, more treaty bodies deciding, more cases to decide, the risk of fragmentation is there, and, and even more so than when Louise Arbour proposed to establish a single unified treaty body. But before digging on whether such developments entail fragmentation at the level of substantive norms, which I hope to come back to later briefly, we may ask whether the committees share a common institutional trajectory when handling individual complaints. And, and to answer this question, I've been working with uh, Professor Bashak Chali uh, on a paper where we comparatively examined the 2013-16 case law of the eight treaty bodies with uh, such competence, and we focused on their approaches to remedies, uh, with their approaches to admissibility criteria, modalities of cross-fertilization, and their approaches to remedies. And, by asking whether the treaty bodies are developing a common institutional trajectory. We uh, were interested in whether the treaty bodies are raising similar expectations among individuals appearing before them, despite their formal standings as separate institutions. And while serving the treaty bodies case law on admissibility, one can observe four common trends. First, over the year, they have broadened their personal material and temporal jurisdiction, thereby, thereby signaling their openness to receive more communications. Second, the treaty bodies have currently indicated which domestic remedies really need to be exhausted for communication to be admissible. And finally, we found that the treaty bodies exhibit a common understanding with respect to what is entailed by the no other forum principle. That is, despite certain textual differences in their founding instrument, they have adopted the narrow understanding of what is the same matter, of what means to be examined, and which other international procedures of investigation or settlement are relevant. Overall, we find that the treaty bodies have adopted a common approach to admissibility, showing that there is a common institutional uh, culture concerning access by individuals and sometimes groups to the committees. While the treaty bodies seem to be advancing in the same direction in terms of admissibility, this trend is taking uh, the shape of an implicit harmonization. The reiteration of the exact same formula by all committees show how harmonization, although implicit, does indeed take place. Explicit citations of other treaty body case law remain far and few between. Overall, self-referential development of case law is the dominant trend in the sense that a committee mostly refers to its own case law. Related to this, we find that when the treaty bodies cite the jurisprudence of regional bodies, is to, it is to support their factual find, findings or provide an evaluation of the human rights situation in a specific state. They rarely, if ever, refer to the regional court to support their interpretation of a substantive issue. We believe that common modalities of cross-fertilization help individuals to understand how they are expected to argue their case before the treaty bodies, what authorities they are expect expected to cite, and in turn, whether the treaty bodies are developing as self-contained regimes or as sites of systemic integration. For us, a common position on cross-citation should be adopted, perhaps something like Article 28 of the Convention on Enforced Disappearance. my slides. I'm sorry. Now the greatest discrepancy is however at the level of, of remedies. For individual remedies, but especially with respect to general remedies. The committees with more recent individual complaint mechanism, but also CERD, 
have a developed a comprehensive way of dealing with general remedies that go beyond legislative or policy reforms. While CAT has generally refrained from for calling for general remedies, not to me mention detailed general remedies, the Human Rights Committee has in the most compelling cases called for reviews, sometimes amendment of domestic law, but not for organization of trainings and awareness raising campaigns. Remedial approach remained diverse at the time ad hoc and case specific, yet CAT's reluctance to pronounce remedies aside, the general pattern is for the treaty body to make keen use of full range of remedies when adopting views on individual case. The 2016 guidelines adopted by the Human Rights Committee on Reparation for us is a, is a good step in the right direction and, and should be followed systematically by the Human Rights Committee, but also by other treaty bodies. And we can see in the latest case law, so after our uh, group of cases that we've reviewed that uh, many committees are, are indeed taking such approach and cap to some extent. Now the treaty bodies overall are able to send comparable signals to states, individuals and NGOs, despite their existence as separate entities. That's what our research reveals. The way uh, the treaty body case law is developing has all the elements for us to attract more and more communication. They encourage individual petitions and signal access friendliness to potential victims of human rights violation. They do not feel obliged by regional human rights jurisprudence and are providing for comprehensive remedial measures. However, success in the sense of popularity has its own perils. Indeed, the increase in the case law that cross UN treaty bodies, coupled with the failure to provide to pro to provide uh, adequate uh, security support following the 2020 review uh, could present a risk for the UN treaty bodies to speak in a consolidated voice to victims of human rights violations in the future. Such risk would further lend support to concern over substantive fragmentation. And there is indeed room for frictions. For instance, while CAT, CBA, CRPT, CES, and CRC have an Electa Unavial clause, HRC, CERD, and, C and CED have a lisa libis uh, pendants clause. Yet, irrespective of the applicable jurisdictional clause, the treaty bodies accept complaints that have been submitted to, but not substantively addressed by regional courts. Nonetheless, some European state, when ratifying the ICCPR optional protocol, have issued a reservation to render the latter jurisdiction subject to the electa una via la una via principle, but such reservation do not mean that we will not have conflicting judgments between the HRC and the European Court of Human Rights. For instance, France's reservation to the Human Rights Committee has not prevented the, the Human Rights Committee to find that the Acker and Ebach communication concerning the burqa ban revealed violation of freedom of religion and non-discrimination, even if their communication had been submitted to the ECHR, found inadmissible by a, a single judge possibly on the manifestly ill-founded uh, reason in light of SAS versus France and other cases from the other case in the likes of the European Court of Human Rights. While we may see this as cultivating a healthy environment of pluralism in the interpretation of human rights, for Hebbage and Yecker, the human rights committees are half a victory. France has indeed turned a blind eye to them, preferring the judgment of the European Court on the, on the issue. So what is the message the treaty bodies are sending to regional courts? Either you examine all petitions in substance or we might overturn your decision. Coming back to the victims and to conclude, the committees are and have been appealing to victims, including those who were unfortunate before regional courts. The numbers show this, the increasing backlog as well. There is an injured need to make sure that the system is able to take more and more petitions from all over the world and address them in a current and uh, unified. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Alexander. I think that the uh, distinction between implicit and explicit reference to the jurisprudence of other treaty bodies as, also, as well as to the regional systems is an extremely interesting one. Uh, the implicit uh, awareness, of course, being very difficult to trace uh, from the face of communications. Um, and we could have a, a lengthy conversation about that issue. Um, and I do hope to be able to engage further with the point you raised at the end about um, the extent to which the treaty bodies uh, are willing to review and second guess decisions of the regional systems um, on common issues before them. 
And with that, I would like to give the floor to uh, my friend and former colleague, uh, Professor de Freville. Thank you very much, Sarah. And thank you to the, to the Academy. I'm very happy that the uh, Paris Human Rights Center is being associated as a partner in the organization of this panel. Uh, as we have been associated in the past also with, uh, with uh, Colombia um, in, um, uh, in, uh, in an endeavor to try to improve, to strengthen this communication system um, by, by many ways. Um, the, the, the problem we are facing um, is the backlog. This is, this is uh, in the title of this, uh, of this panel. Um, the treaty bodies are facing an, an increasing backlog. This is a reality. I will uh, cite some figures um, um, after, but uh, you will see the situation is not so dire, but it's, it's certainly um, being uh, worse and worse. It's worsening with, with time and we have to do something. Um, and among the things that we have to do uh, is to review the methodologies of handling the cases. Uh, uh, and the fact is that we can certainly learn a lot from what the regional systems uh, have already done or are doing to cope with the same issue. And in this spirit, the Paris Human Rights Center and the Geneva Academy together with other partners um, have engaged into a very pragmatic but ambitious process in trying to explore methodologies implemented by regional bodies and see what could be transposed uh, to the UN treaty body system. Um, with, the, um, with in mind the fact that these are comparable systems, but they're also very different in size and also by, by their structure. Um, what we try to do in this process is to focus on the case management system. That is basically how registers and secretariat deal with the communications they receive. Filter communications, respond to them, propose measures to, uh, to, to be taken by the competent bodies, uh, like interim measures, and then prepare the decisions to be taken by the tribunals or the committees in charge. This role in the United Nations is entrusted to the section of the Office of the High Commissioner, namely the Petition and Urgent Actions section. There are, of course, other issues that concern the committee themselves and their procedure, um, and uh, which uh, would also uh, uh, would be needed to be looked at if we want to improve the system. Uh, and here again, there is a lot that we can learn from, from the regional bodies, and I'm thinking in particular of working in chambers, of receiving amicus uh, courier brief, uh, or holding hearings. But these, uh, as useful and essential as they are, um, will be of limited effect if the issue related to the case management system are not solved. And I would say as a preliminary condition to the rest. So that people better understand uh, where we are, I would like to give some figures. Um, the committees currently are registering an average of 300 plus leaning towards 400 communications per year. And the figure is slowly increasing every year. Uh, from 2014 till today, we can see a slow but, sig but significant increase. And by communications registered, I'm, I'm speaking not about the communications received by the Secretariat, but the communications which are deemed prima facie admissible uh, by the rapporteur or the working group on the recommendation of the Secretariat. There are, of course, much more communications received every day that the Secretariat has to deal with, as in fact to read and, and to see and make recommendations about. In terms of output, the treaty bodies are handling about 250 to 300 maximum final decisions a year. By final decisions, I mean mainly the views, uh, concluding on the substance of a case and decisions on admissibility. The backlog of individual communications at the end of 2019 was about 1,600 cases, which have not been decided upon. 
Among these 1,600 cases, 600 are ready to be decided. So uh, that, that is to say that the parties have ended their exchange and the, 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 the case is ready to be decided by the committee. But uh, the Secretariat has not been able, uh, did not have the capacity yet to draft the petition, to draft the, the, the draft view or decision. The backlog is increasing every year. Uh, as I said, the committees have the capacity to uh, take decisions on about 300 cases, and there are more than 300 cases being registered every year. So every year you have the backlog, which is in fact uh, increasing. Um, to this, you have to add the urgent actions under the Convention of, for the Protection of All Persons Against Disappearances. These actions are sent on behalf of persons who have allegedly been victims of enforced disappearances. This is a humanitarian procedure where the committee asks states to, to take all necessary measures to localize the person, whether the person is detained, has been released, or has died. As far as those urgent actions are concerned, in 2014, there were 11 of them registered by the committee now there are more than 1,000 which are registered by the committee and followed uh, every day by the committee. And that is to say by basically by the, the, the petition section. Of course, these figures are very small if you compare it to the regional systems, especially the European court, but also the other regional systems. However, the backlog is increasing every year, as I say. And people are waiting longer and longer for decisions to be made, especially on individual communications, sometimes more than four or five years, which, as Mikiko said in the first panel, is, is, is unacceptable. The conclusion is we have to do something if we want this system not to become an empty shell. First, we are facing a limit in terms of staff. The staff of the petition unit of the treaty branch is 24 qualified members and three administrative assistants covering eight committees with individual communications, the urgent actions of the said and interstate procedure, which are uh, uh, surprisingly more and more used by states. In the 2020 report, um, the, the last 2020 report, uh, the Secretary General reporting on the implementation of six, uh, Resolution 68 to 68, the Secretary General calculated that with the current level of staff, more than six years would be needed to clear the current backlog. That is, without considering any new individual communications received. This is simply mission impossible. Even if we drastically improve the case management system, we won't achieve major progress if we, don't do, if we do not get an increase of the staff of the petition section. In this regard, I would like to recall that the General Assembly Resolution 68 to 68 did not keep its promises. There was an increase in the time allotted to the committees to decide on cases, but this increase of the time was not followed by the necessary increase of the staff. So there is a, a, an amount of time that could not be used by the committees to decide on petitions simply because the petitions did not get to them because the secretary did not have the capacity to decide upon them. In the context of the 2020 review and subsequent developments, the states must take the communications procedures seriously. And it starts with substantial increase of qualified lawyers and administrative staff with the petition and urgent action sections. The recommendations made by the two co-facilitators for the 2020 review are a good start. They express the view, and I quote, that the General Assembly needs to provide the full allocation of resources required by the treaty bodies to effectively carry out their functions and mandates, including the need to secure the necessary supporting staff within the Secretariat. Second, there is a need to improve further the methodologies in dealing with the cases. A number of things can already be done, but major reforms can only be implemented efficiently if the, if the conditions is fulfilled, that is the strengthening of the Secretariat. One thing that can be implemented without delay 
is harnessing technology in order to gain effectiveness in the treatment of cases. The petition section has proposed the setting of a portal similar, uh, I guess, to the one that has been put in place recently by the Inter-American Commission so that applicants can file their communications more easily and so that both parties can access to the file during the procedure. More broadly, the proposal is to set up a comprehensive digital case management system for individual communications and urgent actions, which, and here we draw lessons from the experience of the European Court of Human Rights, which would be uh, uh, composed of the portal, but also of a database and information system on the one hand, and of a document management system on the other end to uh, automatically generate the documents in relation to cases. Again, rather good news is that the co-facilitator have heard this request and have called for an investment, I, call, I quote, to set up such a system. Now it is to be clarified who will be the investor. And I, uh, my submission would be that without waiting for the GA to provide the investment under the ordinary budget, um, a group of states could agree on providing a coordinated extra budgetary contribution to this effect. In conclusion, I would like to recall the words of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Madame Bachelet, who in a statement at the third committee of the GA underscored and I quote that the backlog in dealing with individual complaint now means many petitioners must wait more than four years for a decision on individual complaints. She characterized the situation rightly in my humble opinion, and I quote as a credibility crisis for treaty bodies, for the office and for states in terms of a vital protection system. And more importantly, as a denial of justice for victims of human rights violations around the world. I think it's exactly that. Most of the cases we receive in the committees are from people that have been denied justice at the domestic level. And unfortunately, when turning to the United Nations, they are facing a second denial of justice. We cannot let this go on anymore. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Olivier, and um, I, I appreciate your highlighting at the end the length of time that it is now taking for the treaty bodies to address individual communications, because this used to be an advantage of going to the UN treaty body system, uh, despite the, some of the disadvantages uh, that I think that our advocates will also uh, discuss. Um, but as the length of time is becoming greater, the treaty bodies are losing that strategic advantage. And of course, if the treaty bodies work actually becomes more widely understood, the burden on the individual communications process will be even greater. Um, now let's turn uh, the floor to Ambassador Hernandez Garcia and uh, get the perspective from the Inter-American Human Rights System. Thank Ambassador. you, Sarah. And I want to start by thanking Felix A. Kirschmeier and the Geneva Academy for inviting me to this panel. I congratulate you on this effort in very difficult times. Actually, when I received the invitation to participate in a hybrid meeting, I was thrilled. This is the first time I'm present in a meeting in the last eight months. So I was looking forward to see some people. One of the big incentives was to have uh, Sarah Cleveland in person here chairing this meeting. I think we'll have to leave that for better times. But I hope uh, all my uh, fellow panelists and people here present are doing fine, your families, your colleagues and friends in very difficult times. Now, the question before us is procedural backlog. And this is quite a challenge for the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights since the 90s. The commission has done good progress but there is much to be done. As you know, the protection and defense pillar of the commission includes petitions, cases, friendly settlements, and precautionary measures. And in each of these uh, items, there is a significant backlog. And this is due to several reasons. We have not time to go into, into the 
root causes of the backlog, but just let me give you some numbers. In year 2010, the commission received 1,598 petitions. Last year, we received 3,034, almost double in a 10 year period. Now, in terms of results, the average number of years in the admissibility phase is seven years. And from there, the average number of years in the merits phase, this is in order to have a merits report, is five additional years. It's an average of 12 years since the moment the case goes into the system and the, and the commission issues a recommendation report. Much longer time than the UN treaty bodies as Oliver has just explained. What has the commission done so far? Two th important things. First, the adoption of resolution one slash 2016. And second, the special procedural delay reduction program as part of the commission's strategic plan 2017-2021. What's the core of resolution one 2016? It's two, 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 uh, um, on the basis of that resolution, the commission decides to defer the decision of the admissibility to the merits phase in, 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 under certain circumstances provided in the rules of, rules of procedure. By merging admissibility and the merits phases, uh, we save time in drafting, translating, uh, transmitting requests to parties. Um, uh, in other words, instead of having two reports, the commission obtains one single report. But this is only possible under specific circumstances as provided in the rules of procedure. First, when the consideration of the applicability of a possible exception to the requirement of ex ex exhaustion of domestic remedies would be linked to the merits of the matter. Second, in cases of seriousness and urgency, when the commission considers that life or personal integrity of a person may be in imminent danger. And third, when the passage of time may prevent the effect to till of the decision of the commission. And under that basis, the commission has decided to merge the two phases on a, a given number of cases. But that was not enough. So, uh, when the commission uh, prepared its strategic plan 2016, 2000, uh, um, I'm sorry, 2017, 2021, uh, the commission took the decision to bolster the petition cases, friendly systems and precautionary measures um, as one of the first objectives of the, of, the, of the strategic plan. The strategic plan has been implemented in two phases. The first phase, we could call it institutional strengthening. What did we do it on, on, that, uh, uh, on that basis? First, an ex assistant executive secretariat was established, exclusively devoted to cases and friendly settlements. Second, thanks to the duplication of the budget of the Inter-American system approved by the General Assembly of the Organization of American States in 2017, it was possible to make an, an, an significant increase in staff members. Sec third, we have enhanced job stability for existing staff. In addition, we created a specific uh, uh, section on precautionary measures. We established a processing unit, and finally we established a working group to support the procedural backlog reduction process which has been composed by three commissioners and the executive secretariat of the commission. The second stage uh, uh, deals with structural measures and that includes uh, uh, six measures. First, we establish a special team to ask as a task force for overcoming the procedural backlog at the initial review phase. Second and very important, we implemented an archiving policy uh, which means the reduction in the amount of time that the commission uh, uses in order to close a case due to lack of activity. 
it, we went from five years in 2015 to three years in 2018. Uh, so now when there is no activity on any, on, on the petitioner side, in three years, the case uh, is, uh, is closed. Uh, we have also reduced the number of requests of uh, observations by the parties in the admissibility and merits phase. In the past, it was a quite number of communications. Now those numbers have been reduced. We have also adopted the decision to work on the basis of, uh, of serials of cases at the admissibility phase. This is a pilot program. What does it mean that the commission deals in a package with uh, common matters? For instance, violence against women enforced disappearance, lack of due process in the removal of judges. And this, the, all these cases follow same model reports. So we are, uh, we, we've been working uh, on, on, uh, in series uh, for uh, uh, different countries. At seven, six, uh, we have been making more use of the joinder of cases where the parties are the same or the facts or patterns similar. Uh, of course, taking in, into account the respect of the party's right to defense and equal treatment. Uh, what have been the results? Well, in the year 2016, uh, before the adoption of the strategic plan, uh, the commission adopted 45 admissibility reports. In year 2019, last year, that number was increased to 146 admissibility reports. We are anticipating for this year the adoption of 180 admissibility reports. As, as regards to the merits phase, the commission has also had a significant increase. In the year 2016, uh, the commission approved 16 merits reports. Last year, that number went to 62 reports on the merits. Even if those numbers are a positive sign to bring down the, the, the backlog, the, the portfolio of the, of the commission is still huge. Last year, the portfolio uh, included 4,757 petitions and cases, out of which 3,696 are at the admissibility phase and 1,000 61 are at the merits uh, stage. So the backlog in the portfolio is still uh, huge. A final comment, it, for the, it is important for the commission to make a progress uh, uh, in order to lower the backlog in uh, quantitative terms, but we also have to advance in qualitative terms. What do I mean for that? It's not only to reduce the number of cases is to prioritize those cases which could give uh, a landmark decisions in order to promote changes within countries. Uh, for that, one possible solution that we have uh, that we have put forward is to continue with the uh, special reduction backlog reduction program, but at the same time, use more frequent use of criteria contained in Article 29 of the Rules of Procedure to expedite the evaluation of petitions in two situations. First, when the situation could have the effect of remedying serious structural situations that have an impact on the enjoyment of human rights. And second, when the decision of the Commission could promote changes in legislation or state practices and avoid the reception of multiple petitions on the same matter. Wonderful, thank you so much for that presentation. It's really striking to me how much the considerations that you have been grappling with in the commission are also the issues that the treaty bodies have been grappling with as well as the other regional human rights courts. Um, one thing that the human rights committee does less and less is actually to separate decisions on admissibility and the merits because uh, the committee has found that it tends to produce a lot of redundant work for the committee. Um, and I'm struck by your uh, emphasis on 
job stability for uh, your staff because job instability is a major problem in the petitions unit um, um, and in the OHCHR secretariat for the treaty bodies. Uh, so with that, we will now uh, turn to uh, the experience of our advocates um, in our uh, regional sessions. And I would like to welcome Leah Hochter, uh, who um, I personally admire as a tremendous human rights lawyer and a very tenacious and effective one. Leah, over to you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, and thank you very much to, to all of you for the opportunity on behalf of the Centre for Reproductive Rights to join this, this panel discussion and particular gratitude to Felix and the Geneva Academy for inviting us to, to partner on this very important discussion and be part of these, these conversations. Um, it, I think it's a particular pleasure for me to join this panel and very interesting to be on a panel alongside uh, Sarah and Olivier um, I think many of you may not be aware of the really critical role that they played as members of the Human Rights Committee and that the Human Rights Committee played um, through issuing two seminal decisions in cases against Ireland concerning access to abortion. The, the really critical role that these decisions played in bringing about the very inspiring and uh, major uh, constitutional and legislative reform in Ireland that took place two years ago. So um, we, we had experiences of litigating case, those cases before the committee and, uh, and um, it's, it's a privilege now to, to be back together with Sarah and Olivier, um, learning some of the lessons from, from that experience and other, others of our experience. I think most of you, many of you may know about the Centre for Reproductive Rights. Essentially, we are a global human rights organisation and we use law and policy to advance women's sexual and reproductive health and rights. We work in five regions, have offices in Bogota, Nairobi, Geneva, New York and Washington DC and a big part, not the only part, but a big part of the work that we do is using litigation to advance women's sexual and reproductive rights. And we file complaints with all of the regional and international human rights mechanisms, but my work focuses on Europe and so I'm going to look particularly at the questions and issues we're discussing with a particular lens around the treaty monitoring bodies and the European human rights system and namely the European Court of Human Rights. And so from the perspective of an organization conducting strategic litigation, what influences our choices to file in the regional or the international system, in this case, the European or the, the treaty body system? And why would we choose one or the other? How do we see the relationships? And is there room for improvement? And where might that be? So I think all of the issues that Alexander and Olivier spoke too in terms of the procedural time frame backlog case management admissibility considerations. These are all things that we would consider and they would have a big impact on decisions as to where we would file and, and how to, to do that. But what I wanted to do was focus in on a number of substantive considerations. And the first two points I wanted to highlight in terms of what influences our decisions about where to file a complaint relate to considerations that link into um, kind of considerations related to the mechanisms, but are also related to considerations outside of the mechanisms. And those are what I would call the human element of every case and the political and social element of every case. So first, when we are filing a case, we are doing so usually, unless it's with the European um, Social Charter, it's a coll collective complaint mechanism, we're doing the filing on behalf of an individual. And it is ultimately that individual who is going to decide where they want to file their case. And that will be shaped by what their goals are in terms of filing and what the remedies they are seeking. Um, and so the strategic considerations related to the different mechanisms, the differences between the regional and the international systems and bodies, we will bring those to the individual, we will share them with them and we will think through together um, the different considerations. Ultimately, we will be guided by their wishes, they will make those decisions. And then the second consideration, the political or social one, is relates to the fact that often when you're conducting strategic litigation, the victim is seeking a particular remedy. And, and often what they want to achieve is not just about a remedy for themselves as an individual, but they're also often seeking guarantees of non-repetition. And they're seeking some form of important change at the domestic level that will mean that other people will not be put through the same human rights violation that they faced. 
And so they want the decision, hopefully successful, to impact a national level change. Um, and so for us and for them, it's very important to consider the political and social context in the respondent state and pot potentially even broader regional contexts in terms of deciding where to file and whether it is more strategic to go to a regional or an international forum. And then moving on to the, the considerations of the mechanisms themselves. So what would influence our decision and focus as to forum? So I think the first and, and really big point is the mechanism's jurisprudence, its substantive approach to the kind of issues that the complaint involves. And this is a huge facet for us in making a decision about which may be the most strategic avenue. Ultimately, you want to win. You want to win with a strong substantive outcome. And so you look at where are you going to have the best chance of securing the type of substantive finding you are, you are hoping for. And so for us as an organization that is very focused on gender equality, women's rights and sexual reproductive rights, the fact of the matter is that the treaty bodies have often been far more advanced in their approach to these issues and in their willingness to consider these issues as human rights violations than, for example, has been the European Court of Human Rights, except maybe on the issues of LGBTI rights. And so for, for us in reality, it has often simply been safer to file complaints with the treaty bodies in terms of achieving the kind of substantial outcome that we, we wish for. And this, I think, is particularly the case where the issue is a new one for the human rights system as a whole. And I think that brings us to this issue of cross-fertilization that I, I know was mentioned in the, the, the panel um, description. Um, and the role that the development of interpretation and application of rights to new issues by an international mechanism can have on shaping the jurisprudence of a regional mechanism and vice versa. And I think in a way this cross fertilization or jurisprudential cohesion as, an, as, a, as a lawyer and an applicant, that's how I would term it, um, is so important for those of us conducting this type of litigation. And what's very positive for us is that we have seen a lot of this cross fertilization in the area of gender equality and women's rights flowing from the treaty bodies to the European Court of Human Rights. So we have seen the court following the reasoning and jurisprudence of the treaty monitoring bodies very explicitly um, on issues like forced sterilization, violence against women, and slower, but we hope also progressing on sexual reproductive rights like abortion access. And for us, a lack of this kind of cross fertilization where we wouldn't see this judicial or ju jurisprudential cohesion, but instead where we would have a notable divergence in approach causes big problems. Um, so for example, if the treaty bodies and the court take significantly divergent approaches to the same, in terms of the application of the same right to the same issue, the political impact um, of the discrepancy can be, can be problematic and it can lessen the positive impact of the stronger decision. As Alexander mentioned, um, this is particularly the case in the European region, where if we have a very strong treaty body decision on an issue and the European court takes a divergent approach, this can lead to difficulties because there will be an tendency and a wish on the part of the European states parties to go with the decision that they like better, i.e. that of the European Court of Human Rights. Um, and you can imagine that this kind of divergence would be even more impactful and problematic if it was to take place on complaints involving the same region, but maybe even worse relating to the same country. Um, and that, I think, leads me to the other element that I wanted to highlight for, in terms of what for us are very important factors in our strategic considerations in terms of bringing complaints, and that relates to the legal and political status, either perceived or real, of the relevant mechanism and related considerations regarding enforcement and implementation. And I think that the reality is that while there are many important exceptions, um, it can often be challenging to get compliance with treaty body decisions as opposed to regional court decisions. And so in Europe, the risk that we are always having to weigh up is the potential of this offhand government or state response of this is a non-binding decision and therefore there is a refusal to comply. And so when you're seeking justice for an individual, you're seeking legal policy reform at a domestic level, 
you have to weigh this into your decision as to where you will file your case. Um, because often, even though there may be delays, there may be problems in the implementation of European court judgments, there is at least a lip service uh, paid by governments and states to the need to comply with these judgments. And so I think for us um, and, and for the mechanisms themselves, the question is what can we do to build more understanding of the role of treaty monitoring bodies as quasi-judicial bodies, as adjudicative bodies. Um, and I think that's where we would really like to see the treaty bodies themselves, the OHCHR secretariat, doing more to really enable the treaty bodies step into and own this role and to also unpack in a very clear way for states parties their international obligations of good faith in terms of that they have accepted by ratifying the OPs, they have accepted the jurisdictions of committees to hear complaints, by ratifying the treaties they have accepted the obligation to provide remedies to victims of violations. Um, because I think the reality is that there is only so much we can do as civil society organizations, as academia, if the international system itself does not assert or claim that type of role for the treaty bodies. And I welcome a lot of what Olivier was talking about in terms of processes that may be underway, which I think will, will assist in that. Um, even some of the, the recent developments in terms of clarifying processes for third party interventions, um, the publication of case pipelines for some of the committees, these are really good steps in the right direction. But I think embracing this role involves more than that. Um, and I think for us, embracing the role really requires an understanding on behalf, on the part of the international system, the committees, but also the secretariat of the impact that treaty bodies, jurisprudence and decisions can have in bringing about really important changes domestically. And that these decisions are not and shouldn't be considered simply abstract rulings impacting the international human rights framework, they really can impact the situation on the ground, the lives of human beings and state parties. And I think that is something that the regional courts are much more cognizant of, um, perhaps can make the European court sometimes hesitant to do the, the you know, issue the right type of decision. Um, but I think the more cognizance of that, the better. Um, and I think that's where I wanted to, to just briefly describe the situation of the, what happened with the Human Rights Committee cases in, in, in relation to Ireland on access to abortion and how um, even though there were um, questions in the Irish context around whether these were binding decisions um, and whether or not uh, they had an obligation to comply. The fact was that the, the Irish government and state took the decisions extremely seriously and took the, um, the fact that Ireland had been held to account in, these, in this fora and that these decisions had been issued extremely seriously. And a process of law reform on abortion um, in, in some ways resulted as a result of the two Human Rights Committee decisions. And when kind of the, the state was taking its decision as to whether or not to hold this constitutional referendum on access to abortion and to change its law on abortion, um, it noted three particular reasons that it would recommend this change to the Irish people. And one of those reasons was these, these decisions by the Human Rights Committee. And so I think this is, this is a case, these were cases, this is a, a case study, if you like, of a situation where the impact of a treaty body decision was huge um, for, for a member, for a state party, was huge for the lives of people in, and has had, you know, its repercussions will continue through, throughout the ages. Um, and I think that more can be done potentially also by the secretariat to make sure that this knowledge of these types of case examples is known by the treaty body members and is also showcased by the secretariat in terms of the impact that these decisions can have and that these decisions don't just live in an international uh, or Geneva abstract human rights universe, but have, can have really meaningful 
implications on the ground. And then the very final issue I just wanted to flag at the end relates to precedent. Um, and I think, again, the extent to which a mechanism will follow its own jurisprudential approach. And of course, all uh, treaties are living instruments. Developments in interpretation should and will occur. We argue often for this kind of evolution in jurisprudence. Um, but one thing that we are wary of sometimes is uh, a tendency in terms of treaty bodies to just on an ad hoc basis depart on a case by case um, consideration from what we would have understood to be precedent. And this can also be a, a problematic approach. And I think we, this is something where we see more of this from the treaty bodies than we would, for example, from, from the European Court of Justice. So I'll stop there and uh, look forward to the discussion and, and thanks again. Terrific, thank you so much. That was an extremely rich presentation. I of course, completely agree with you that I think that it's very, very important, I think particularly for states to be aware of uh, the extent to which other states do comply with uh, the views as well as the concluding observations of treaty bodies. Um, there's actually you know, extensive evidence of compliance, but a lot of it is below the radar. Um, I think the point about jurisprudential cohesion is an extremely interesting one because of course, uh, you and other advocates before these bodies will want the cohesion to move in a particular direction um, that is protective for your clients. Um, but the example that Alexander gave of the French um, full face veil case, um, because the European Court of Human Rights had previously found no violation by France, if the Human Rights Committee had followed that decision, jurisprudential cohesion would have suggested that in the entire region of Europe, um, in the entire Council of Europe region, there, these laws did not raise human rights concerns. Um, and I know there are differing views on that, including on this panel. Um, but my personal view is that it was important to have uh, the differing position of the Human Rights Committee out there. And of course, these decisions um, by courts and treaty bodies ultimately are only as um, effective as they are persuasive. So the real work lies in making uh, the decisions as persuasive as possible. So let's now turn to um, our final speaker before we have our uh, uh, time for discussion. Uh, Gay So, we're particularly delighted to have you with us. Um, I think uh, the conversation between the UN human rights treaty bodies and the African regional system is the weakest link in this uh, connectivity conversation. Um, I think for reasons of lack of knowledge on the side of the treaty bodies and lack of information flow in both directions. Um, and I'd love to think about ways to improve that relationship. Uh, so let me turn it over to you. Thank you. Um. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Quislan, the chair. Uh, thank you for, uh, uh, to the Geneva Academy for inviting me. I, you can see I'm going in and out. I'm having some connection issues which we're trying to um, sort out uh, in the office. So you would have to excuse me if at some point I start having uh, issues here and there. But um, uh, before I move on to talk about the uh, relationships, uh, possible relationship between the African system, the UN system, and of course, why some of us use the African system instead of maybe filing cases before the UN mechanisms, even though some of our countries have uh, ratified um, most of the UN treaties. I, I would want to maybe just give it context, background information, some general information on the, the African system uh, uh, some of us, or I'm sure most of us know that uh, we have uh, many human rights treaties at the Africa level. Uh, there is the Parent Charter, the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. And as most of us might know, the Charter does not only have civil political rights, it also provides for economic, social, cultural rights. In addition to individual rights, it also provides for group rights. And the African Commission, the ECOWAS Court, have consistently held that there is no right guaranteed in the African Charter that they cannot give effect to. So this bit about 
progressively realizing rights guaranteed in a particular treaty as you have in the UN system, I mean, is actually frowned at, at the continental level, that's at the Africa level. So there is the parent charter, like I said, the African charter, which is at the moment ratified by all African states. Uh, I think uh, apart from Morocco, Morocco left, came back a few years ago. Then there are also some other protocols like SIDAO at the UN, at the Africa level, there is the Maputo Protocol on the rights of women. There is like the CRC at the UN level, at the Africa level, we also have the African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child. And there are also treaties, you know, like the OAU Convention, which applies to refugees. There is another a treaty um, applying to internal, internally displaced persons. Most of all, the uh, treaties, human rights treaties at the regional level. Interestingly, uh, in Africa, at the sub-regional level, West Africa, East Africa, Southern Africa, we also have human rights treaties, you know, like ECOWAS, for example, has uh, a supplementary protocol on democ democracy, elections, good governance, which deals with a lot of human rights issues. And uh, um, that's that for the instruments. Then at the Africa level, we also have a host of mechanisms. Uh, there is the African court, which uh, sits in Arusha, and uh, to, for the court to uh, receive cases against any state, that state does not only have to ratify the protocol setting of the court, the state is required to make a declaration allowing individuals and access, direct access to the African court. So it's slightly different. At some point, about nine African states made that declaration, but a, couple, a few of them withdrew. So now we have about six, seven uh, that have not uh, withdrew, withdrawn their declaration with respect to 34-6. So which means when it comes to accessing the African court, only citizens in those countries that made that declaration can file a case before it. Other than the African court, there is the African Commission. There is also the African Committee of Experts on the Rights and Welfare of the Child. And at the sub-regional level, there is the East African uh, Community Court of Justice, which deals with human rights cases. There is also uh, the ECOWAS Court of Justice, which also deals with human rights cases. In Southern Africa, there was a SADC tribunal, but that tribunal was disbanded many years ago. So African Court, African Commission, African Committee of Experts on the Rights and Welfare of the Child, the ECOWAS Court, East African Court, all of them can entertain cases, as in you can file cases before all these mechanisms. But we, for the African Court, we have to take note of the point I made earlier, requiring states to make a declaration. So now I would want, in talk, I mean, I would want to uh, talk about uh, the relationship and maybe some of the instruments I have just mentioned and maybe the mechanisms. And in dealing with the relationships, I also would try to point out why uh, we think in some instances we're better off filing cases before the African court. I think one thing I wanted to take note of before I even get into the relationships is if you look at the um, uh, rules of the African Commission, the rules of the committee, you realize they are very flexible when it comes to standing, you know, very flexible rules when it comes to uh, who file cases before this mechanisms. And in particular, a court like the ECOWAS court is extremely important in the sense, even though it is an international court, you know, with a contentious jurisdiction, you don't need to show your exhausted local remedies to file cases before that court. So that is an advantage. In a sense, that, although that court sits as a court of first instance. And I speak, as I speak to you, my office has more than five cases, some on slavery, some on sexual gender-based violence before that mechanism. So these are uh, some very, very uh, good advantages, reasons why some of us uh, use some of these mechanisms. But in terms of relationships, I just want to highlight a few. If you look at um, the ECOWAS court, for example, the treaty setting of the court, the protocol setting of the court, it makes it clear that the court can, you know, uh, receive complaints of human rights violations from member states of ECOWAS. In a sense, the court uh, sorry, violations don't, I mean, do not just have to relate to African treaties. When my office filed cases before the ECOWAS court, we refer to the Universal Declaration, we refer to the ICCPR, we refer to the Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights Convention, so, a covenant, sorry. This is extremely important in the sense our hands are really not tied by, you know, African treaties ratified by the state. 
So far, as long as it is a human rights treaty and it is ratified by a state in West Africa, you can go to the ECOWAS court and push for it to be enforced. So I think that that, 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 that is an advantage. Clearly, that shows that is really a very, very important relationship between international instruments our states have ratified and some of the mechanisms I referred to. So nothing stops me from referring to the ICCPR, International Covenant, Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, CEDAW, and a host of others. What you look for is whether the state you're suing has made uh, you know, the ratification. Once the ratification is there, you're free to invoke that treaty when you appear before the ECOWAS court. One other thing, talking about the relationship, is if you look at Article 60 and Article 61 of the African Charter, our parent charter, African Charter on Human and People's Rights, um, the African Commission, for example, is allowed to draw inspiration from other treaties. The treaties could be international, you know, it could be the Universal Declaration, it could be the ICCPR. So, which means, in dealing with a complaint, in dealing with a case, relying on Article 6061 of the African Charter, nothing stops the African Commission, nothing stops the African Court from drawing inspiration from a UN treaty not just treaties, in fact, UN soft law, particularly if that is deemed important. So uh, that is a great deal of flexibility in this case. And in fact, if you look at the African Committee of Experts on the Rights and Welfare of the, sorry, African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child, which is our regional CRC, Article 46.2 allows the committee in dealing with cases to draw inspiration from other international treaties, you know. So which means uh, when we litigate, whether we are appearing before the African Commission, whether we are appearing before the African Court, whether we are appearing before the uh, ECOWAS Court, we are allowed to draw inspiration from UN treaties. I can give an example. A few years ago, we dealt with a case against um, Kenya. Uh, we call it the Nubian Adults case before the African Commission. If you look at the African Charter, it does not expressly provide for the right to a nationality. So what we did when we filed our brief, we made submissions urging the African Commission to draw inspiration from the Universal Declaration, which specifically provides for the right to a nationality. So we submitted. Unfortunately, the Commission saw things our way. In a sense, relying on 6061, we urged or we uh, um, requested uh, the African Commission to um, uh, you know, uh, draw inspiration from international treaties. Other than that, uh, at our level, that's my organization, every time we file cases, either before the African court, ECOWAS court, or the Committee of Experts on the Law Rights and Welfare of the Child, we draw a lot of inspiration from decisions adopted by some of these UN bodies. I can give an example. When we filed the first SGBV case before the ECOWAS court against Nigeria, we referred, we referred to Jalo versus Bulgaria. That is a case decided by the CEDAW Committee on Sexual Gender-Based Violence. And fortunately, the ECOWAS Court was able to rule in our favor. But then, other than referring to decisions uh, you know, adopted by CEDAW in some instances, we also refer very extensively to decisions adopted by the Human Rights Committee, by the you know, uh, CART Committee a host of others. And other than that, we also, when we, you know, draft our arguments, refer very extensively to general recommendations adopted by the UN. We also refer in particular to general comments uh, adopted by the Human Rights Committee. So we really, really draw a lot of inspiration from, from, from the UN system. In a sense, some of these recommendations are quite detailed. So we try to at least borrow leave from them. So in a sense, you can see, you know, a relationship synergies here and there, you know, relying on UN treaties, UN soft law, to really make sure we push for a change or we push for change in our various countries. One other, one other area I wanted to highlight is with respect to implementation. The biggest problem we're facing at the regional level now relates to implementation of decisions adopted by um, our regional bodies whether we're talking about the African court, whether we're talking about the Committee of Experts on the Rights and Welfare of the Child, ECOWAS Court, African Commission. So what we have tried doing, we have started realizing sometimes when the pressure comes from the UN, probably that might be more effective, 
you know, or that could help in maybe pushing for change. So what we do now, whether we're talking about concluding observations adopted during state reporting, or whether we're talking about recommendations from the African Commission, judgments of the ECOWAS court, judgments of the African court, when we push for implementation, we try to find ways of at least using the UN system. Like, for example, uh, we, got a, we won a case against um, the DRC a few years ago. Uh, it's quite groundbreaking. We call it the Kilwa decision. And when we met to draw up a roadmap as to what we can do to push the government to implement, we decided the decision raises is very important recommendation. And for as long as it remains unimplemented, we will continue to you know, push as an advocacy strategies to make sure we push the government into implementing. And in our roadmap, we talked about using the UPR process because the decision raises very, very fundamental issues, very, very important issues. So when, for example, the DRC comes up for review, we say that then is an opportunity we can use to make sure we remind the government of its obligations and, of course, try to see if we could get the Human Rights Council also involved through the UPR process. Of course, a lot of our states are party to so many treaties at the UN level. We also, in the roadmap I just referred to, that is just one out of many other things we have in mind. We say, even outside of the UPR, when a state comes up, uh, you know, for review, not sorry, not for review, when a state submits this report, whether we're talking about the Committee Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, whether we're talking about the Human Rights Committee, when a state report is being considered, we think we can also try to compile information on some of the cases we've worked on, particularly on recommendations that really have not been responded. And then we would try to make sure at least we bring that to the attention of the really relevant treaty body. In fact, we did that just about a week, two weeks ago. We worked on a report on enforced disappearances during the Ijamme period. That was at a time in the Gambia. That was at a time when the Gambia had a dictator as president. So we were able to compile a report and we should be sharing it with the you know, Committee on Enforced Disappearances in the next weeks. So it's about realizing when we push for implementation, we shouldn't just restrict ourselves to the African mechanisms. We should try our best to make sure we use the UPR process. Uh, in addition to the UPR process, we can also try to use the UN treaty bodies. Other than that, we can, in fact, also use the special mechanisms of the Human Rights Council. In some instances, maybe, you know, requesting for urgent appeals, urgent call, you know, urgent action, et cetera, et cetera. So all these are things uh, we uh, have in mind and we would continue to really push for. Um, in terms of, you know, recommendations for, um, um, uh, what is it, um, improvements. Um, for us, like I said earlier on, the biggest problem we're now having is lack of implementation of our decisions. So uh, I would, like I said, uh, maybe recommend that we continue to at least use the UN mechanisms I, I, I referred to earlier on. But then uh, doing so would also mean trying to engage with other CSOs that work at the UN level. My office, our work is just restricted to the continent. Maybe what we try to do, try to make sure we at least create a common platform with CSOs that work at the UN level so that if there is a need for us to push or advocate for any particular issue, we could find ways of working with them so that at least we would create synergies, common ground, you know, uh, in making sure all these things are done. So it's about, you know, solidarity, try to make sure we get a sense of what obtains at the UN level, try to make sure we build bridges so that that way we can cooperate, collaborate to help in pushing uh, uh, for change. One other thing, uh, for those of us who are conversing with the um, African human rights system, you would realize that some of our mechanisms have been facing a few threats, you know, a few, a couple of years ago, a few years ago, the African Commission, for example, uh, gave observer status to uh, the coalition of you know, African lesbians. And of course, the political organs you know, pushed the African Commission into having that observer status withdrawn. So in a sense, other than that, we have been seeing a few like, you know, like a pushback, particularly from the political actors which means, uh, I mean, if our system remains vulnerable, if it remains weak, 
at the end of the day, those of us who use it might start facing all kinds of problems. So which means we then are saying, if that is a need or if that is a possibility of getting any kind of support, advocacy, in maybe I mean, pushing our political actors to very much appreciate the differences some of these mechanisms can you know, make, the need for them to remain independent, I'm sure that too would be very much appreciated by the actors um, at the regional level. I, uh, I only have about 10 minutes, you know, and I think I have exhausted my 10 minutes. But what I wanted to bring in, just to make it clear, at the Africa level, we're very much aware of our commitments at the UN level. What we're trying to do now is try to make sure at least we build a bridge, try to make sure if necessary, we use the still reporting procedure. If necessary, we also use the UPR system. But then in doing so, there would be the need for us to try reaching out to organizations that operate at the level so that we can find ways of at least of finding common ground in pushing for human rights protection at the UN and at the Africa level. So I thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you so much. That was uh, exceptional. And I think that your, um, the picture you paint of the permeability of the various African human rights mechanisms to the jurisprudence of the UN system is a nice bookend to the uh, picture that Alexandra painted at the beginning of the relative impermeability of the treaty bodies, e even to each other's jurisprudence, let alone to that of the regional systems. Um, so one thing that we should think about is how to make those channels work equally in both directions. Mm -hmm.